And good evening. Is the future of the GOP still in the hands of former President Trump? The victories by candidates endorsed by him and the major defeat for one of his most public enemies, Wyoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney, losing her primary race by nearly 40 points. Her standing in the Republican Party sharply dropping after taking a leading role on the House committee investigating January 6th. However, in an exclusive interview with our Savannah Guthrie, she says her political career is not over, even suggesting a possible run for president. The running as a Republican and winning anytime soon, she acknowledged, is a stretch. In Alaska, NBC News projects the state's former governor, Sarah Palin, is advancing to a general election for the state's sole House seat. She's been a vocal supporter of former President Trump and landed his endorsement as she tries to stage a political comeback. So is the Republican Party taking on a new shape? Let's get right to Von Hilliard. In a Republican Party battle that could define our times. This is not a game. Every one of us must be committed to the eternal defense of this miraculous experiment called America. Liz Cheney, the Wyoming Congresswoman, and Donald Trump's chief Republican antagonist, losing overwhelmingly to Harriet Hageman, who calls the 2020 election rigged and was backed by the former president. His clear and unwavering support from the very beginning propelled us to victory tonight. Trump in a social media post saying Cheney can now, quote, finally disappear into the depths of political oblivion. But in an exclusive interview with Savannah Guthrie. I don't see it as death this morning. Cheney saying she isn't going anywhere and will do whatever it takes to keep Trump from winning the presidency again. I think that defeating him is going to require uh, a broad and united front of Republicans, Democrats and independents. Uh, and that's uh, what I intend to be uh, to be part of. Are you considering running for president yourself? It is something that I, uh, I'm thinking about and I'll make a decision uh, in the coming months. I think that's about the worst idea I've heard in a long time. I hope she runs for president. I mean, she's been a great example of integrity and a great patriot. Now at least eight of the 10 Republican U.S. House members who voted to impeach Trump last year will not return to Congress next term. A visitor from the future might look back on 2022 and say that this is the year the Re Republicans became a personality cult. Cheney last night, with her father watching from the audience, suggesting this is a new GOP. I believe deeply in the principles and the ideals on which my party was founded, but I love my country more. All right, Von Hillier joins Top Story Live tonight. Von, you've been on the campaign trail for us. I want to turn to Pennsylvania tonight and the race between Dr. Oz and Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman for Senate there. Fetterman just called Oz out for this video. He posted to Twitter uh, grocery shopping back in April. Let's take a look. I thought I did some grocery shopping. I'm at Wagner's and I, my wife wants some vegetables for crudite, right? So here's a broccoli. That's two bucks, not a ton of broccoli there. There's some asparagus. That's four dollars. Yep. Carrots. That's four more dollars. That's ten dollars of vegetables there. And then we need some guacamole. That's four dollars more. And she loves salsa. Yeah, there's salsa there. Six dollars. Must be a shortage of salsa. Guys, that's twenty dollars for crudite. This doesn't include the tequila. I mean, that's outrageous. And we got Joe Biden to thank for this. All right. Crudite and tequila, Vaughn. I know you've covered a lot of campaigns and you've covered a lot of different states. Talk to us about the significance of this video, because the Democrat in this race, Fetterman, claims he's been able to raise half a million dollars off this video. So how big of an issue is this right now for Dr. Oz? I mean, the reality is, is that Dr. Oz is now down significantly in polling here. And this is at a time, Tom, in which most in the political atmosphere were expecting big wins for Republicans in the Senate and in the House this November. But Dr. Oz is looking to replace a current Republican senator in Pennsylvania who is retiring. So if the Democrats and John Fetterman, who's really sort of playing this part of the everyman, were able to pick up this seat, it would be significant. Dr. Oz is a longtime resident of New Jersey, has had this mansion here. And then when you look here, uh, making this political play at this last moment here, it's it's really put up a lot of tension because Republicans need this seat. And when you look at several other states, they're on the cusp of potentially losing to Democrats in those places, too. That is why this is a such concern in this viral video. It's turning a lot of heads for the folks that are watching these political races very closely. Yeah, trying Tom. to appeal to everyday voters with the crudite was an interesting.
interesting choice of words there. All right, Von Hilliard from the campaign trail. As always for us, Von, we appreciate it. Next tonight, another member of former President Trump's inner circle, Rudy Giuliani, appearing before a grand jury today, testifying for six hours as part of an investigation into efforts to overturn the 2020 election. This is former Vice President Mike Pence said he would consider testifying to the January 6th committee. Kristen Welker has that story. Tonight, former Vice President Mike Pence hinting he may be open to testifying before the January 6th committee. Well, I would, if there was an invitation to participate, I would consider it. Pence, whose top aides have already testified, also seemed to endorse the committee's work. The American people have a right to know what happened that day. And in the months and years ahead, I'll be telling my story even more frequently. Pence broke with Mr. Trump after January 6th when rioters called for him to be hanged. Today, he tried to walk a fine line on the Mar-a-Lago search, which has enraged many Republicans, urging the attorney general to release more information, but also calling for a halt on the attacks against law enforcement. And Mr. Pence seemed to tease a possible run for the White House while at a favorite spot for potential candidates. I've, I've never spent a lot of time in New Hampshire, but I may someday. A defiant former President Trump lashing out at the January 6th committee today, saying in the wake of Vice Chair Congresswoman Liz Cheney's defeat overnight, I assume the January 6th committee of political hacks and thugs will quickly begin the beautiful process of dissolution. It all comes as the investigations swirling around the former president are intensifying. Today, Mr. Trump's former attorney Rudy Giuliani testified before a federal grand jury in Atlanta for six hours. It's where he led the president's efforts to overturn the state's 2020 election results. It is clear that the count you have right now is false. Giuliani was told he's the target of the probe. His attorney saying he would invoke attorney-client privilege if asked about conversations with his former boss. All right, Kristen Welker joins us now from the White House. And Kristen, I know tomorrow's going to be a big day for several investigations involving the former president, both in New York and at the federal level. What are we expecting to happen? Tom, that's absolutely right. This is going to be a very big day. The Florida judge who approved the Mar-a-Lago search warrant will hear arguments over the unsealing the, aff- the affidavit. Mr. Trump wants it released, and so do news outlets, including NBC News. But DOJ says it would be harmful. Meanwhile, Alan Weisselberg, he's the Trump Organization's former CFO. He's expected to plead guilty to state tax crimes and testify against the Trump Corporation but not against Mr. Trump, his former boss. It should be very interesting, Tom. All right, Kristen, welcome for us tonight. Kristen, we appreciate that. We do want to turn to the weather tonight. Record heat hitting the west where sweltering temperatures are ramping up the wildfire threat there and storms slamming the Gulf Coast and southwest with excessive rainfall, putting those regions at risk for flash flooding. For more on that forecast, I want to bring in our good friend, NBC meteorologist Bill Karens, who joins us tonight. Bill, great to see you again. Walk us through what's happening over the next couple of days. Yeah, so many people in the eastern half of the country got their relief. Not the case in the northwest. And we're at the peak heating of the day right now. So this is a about as max temperatures as you're going to get. Boise, 102 right now. Las Vegas, 103. Notice that Las Vegas and Phoenix has been a cloudy and enough rain around to keep your temperatures down. Not the case, though, in the Pacific Northwest. We have numerous areas that are right around their record high for the date. Missoula, you're one away right now. Redding, you're one away. You're at 109 in Redding right now. And we broke our record high um, in areas right around Salt Lake City. Right now, 99, the record being 100. The last hour, you were at 100. So 22 million people under heat advisories and heat warnings. This continues through Friday. Friday, so we're not done yet in the Northwest. And tomorrow we should break your record high in Seattle. It's going to be a very difficult day without air conditioning again at 91 degrees. Medford should be close to your record high. You get the idea. The other story that's going to be developing this week is all the tropical moisture in the Southwest. We've had numerous flash flooding. A lot of the washes and small creeks and streams have already had their flooding, so the water levels are already kind of high in some areas. We have numerous flash flood warnings already north of the Phoenix area, heading up in the Rim Country here. And as we go through throughout the next couple days, it's going to get worse. We're going to get some tropical moisture coming from areas of South Texas heading this way. Here's all the thunderstorms right now dotting around Phoenix and up here towards Prescott. But this is the day of biggest concern, Friday. And when we get this moderate risk of flash flooding in a huge area like this, this is when we can get significant flooding, like when we had in West Virginia and Kentucky. So Friday is the day to watch. Okay. Bill, we appreciate all of that. And let's turn to northern Mexico because heavy rain and flooding there is complicating rescue efforts to save 10 miners who have been stuck underground for two weeks now. Mexican authorities now asking for the help of an American company as the families of those trapped cling to hope while losing their patience. Juan Venegas has more. Trapped underground, 
and no way to communicate with them for over two weeks. Tonight, 10 Mexican miners remain stuck with all exits flooded at the Pinabete coal mine less than 100 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border. More than 500 men, including military engineers and volunteer miners, are working to save the men. The hope is for them to remain alive. El bueno está ahí arriba. El bueno es el que decide todo. God will decide. He knows it all. Others have been found with more time, said this miner helping with the efforts. Nearby, families, including children, have been waiting for days. Suhei's uncle is one of the trapped miners. Abrazarlo. I want to hug him, and I ask God for him as my gift, she told reporters. But the days add on, and the chances to find them alive diminishes. The challenges are piling on with heavy rain and new flooding. Continuamos en la mina de Pinabete. This week, federal authorities informing efforts to pump out the water were almost successful when more water from a nearby mine flooded the mine shaft once again. That other mine, abandoned in 1996, when it also flooded. Engineers now attempting to insert cement into the ground and build a retaining wall that would cut the water flow. Meanwhile, 13 pumps operate around the clock to clear the flooding. Friends of the trapped miners not giving up, some even joining the rescue efforts after working full-time shifts at other nearby mines. These are friends, and we're going to help, said this man. Yet for now, the country can only wait for the new flooding to be cleared in hopes of finally getting to the men alive. And Mexican government officials said they have reached out to two different companies to get ideas on how to rescue the workers. One company is in the U.S. and a second one in Germany. Meanwhile, Navy divers uh, have also tried entering those mine shafts, but they did say that the amount of debris, pipes and cables made it impossible for them to get through. So we'll just have to wait for some of the flooding to clear. Tom. Guad Venegas for us tonight. Guad, we thank you for that. We want to head overseas now to the latest from the war in Ukraine. The Russian military striking the Odessa region, hitting a recreation center. Ukraine emergency services reporting at least four civilians were injured in that strike. For more, NBC's Josh Letterman joins us now from Ukraine with the latest. So, Josh, this isn't the only Ukrainian city under fire tonight. That's right, Tom. All across this country, Russian missiles are still striking cities on a near daily basis. And there is still martial law and a strict curfew, which is why we're speaking to you from indoors tonight here in Poltava, Ukraine. And as Russia has been struggling in the south and in the east, it has been picking up its attacks in Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, which was a major target of the Russians earlier in the war. The state emergency service saying that seven people were killed in an attack on a residential building today. Another 16 wounded video showing people still being pulled out of the rubble, as President Zelensky calls it, a vile attack that he says will face retaliation from Ukraine. Yeah, deadly strike there in Kharkiv. Though the Ukrainians are fighting back with a new strategy, if you will, attacking Russia in deeply held pockets where the Russians have control in Ukraine, correct? That's exactly right. And this appears to be a real stepped up effort by the Ukrainians to attack deep into Russian held territory. There have been a number of explosions in the past week or so in Crimea, which appear to signify the first times in this war that Russia has been that Ukraine has been able to strike Crimea. And while Ukraine's government is not officially taking responsibility uh, for those attacks, it is signaling that there could be more to come, urging Ukrainians who are still in Crimea to stay away from Russian military installations while insisting that anything in Crimea, including the bridge that Russia has built from Crimea to mainland Russia, is a legitimate military target, Tom. All right, Josh Letterman from Ukraine for us. Josh, we thank you for that. Back here at home to the highway shooting rampage near Little Rock, Arkansas, that has left three people dead and multiple people hurt. State police saying a driver is in custody. The car he was driving connected to a number of the shootings this weekend. He's now facing capital murder charges for at least two of them. NBC News correspondent Shaq Shaquille Brewster joins us now. So Shaq, state police initially said it was 11 incidents. They now say it's 17. How do they determine that, that all these incidents are connected? And, and how is he doing these shootings? 
Well, Tom, part of that is because some of the people who were involved in these incidents, they reported after the fact, after the news of this rampage made its way across the community. But I had a conversation with the interim police chief earlier today, and he said this is an investigation that is still well underway. It involves three different law enforcement agencies. And what we've heard from police so far is that seven of those shootings were involving a gray Mercedes. Now, state police using surveillance video from one of those shooting sites, they identified the suspect, identified the vehicle, and that's how they were able to bring in the suspect. But I asked the interim chief, are they confident and how confident are they that all these 17 shootings are related? Listen here. I, I think we're looking at them as, as very possible just because of the time and distance uh, and, and the way it was kind of rapidly evolving. But I do not want to jump to any conclusions because there's always the possibility one or more of these could be unrelated. But we will uh, uh, take our time do our due diligence and work through all of the evidence that's available until the point that we can come back before uh, uh, the media here locally and, uh, and share what we find. Tom, police say that in all of those seven incidents involving the gray Mercedes, it was a vehicle shooting at another vehicle. That's what is connecting most of these. But the, there's very clear that investigators have more information that they're not releasing to the public that is tying all these 17 incidents together. Yeah, a, a, a terrifying amount of crimes there. Shaq, do we, what do we know about the suspect and the charges he's facing, at least right now? He's 31 years old and he's facing some very serious charges, including two counts of uh, committing terroristic acts. We also know that he's facing a count of uh, capital murder and an attempted capital murder. So these are very serious crimes. And, you know, one thing that I did hear from the interim chief is that this is not something that this community is used to. He says that as long as he's been in this department, he's never seen a situation where you've seen so many shootings in such a short and small amount of area over a short period of time. This is something that is definitely shaken up a lot of people here. But he's saying members of the community do not have a reason to be concerned. They're still investigating to make sure that those 17 instances were connected to this one person. Tom? Back now with a stunning admission from the CDC late this afternoon. The agency acknowledging it fell short in its response to the COVID-19 pandemic after months of harsh criticism. Director Rochelle Walensky promising to restructure that organization as it battles the growing threats from monkeypox, polio, and other outbreaks. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more. Tonight, the CDC director is calling for drastic changes within the agency to better deal with public health emergencies. Dr. Rochelle Walensky now says, in our big moment, our performance did not reliably meet expectations. How significant is that acknowledgement? It's monumental. This speaks to not just the intent to acknowledge it, but the action that must follow and the accountability. The agency had been slammed as slow to respond during COVID, also facing backlash after issuing guidance that seemed confusing. The sweeping reorganization includes a new executive council, a new equity office, and a more streamlined website. Walensky also plans to ask Congress to grant the CDC new powers, including mandating that local jurisdictions share their data. The course correction comes as federal health officials face criticism over the monkeypox vaccine rollout. The administration invested more than a billion dollars developing it, but has just over a million shots on hand. There are also new concerns about polio, just the second instance of U.S. community spread in 43 years. Last week, health officials announced that polio had been detected in New York City wastewater. Make sure that your children are protected because this is a very, very serious disease. Today, a polio vaccine clinic opened in Rockland County, New York, an area where the vaccination rate is as low as 37 percent. I may have gotten it as a child, but I wasn't sure about my records, and my so that's why I came to do it. If you aren't sure about your immunization records, 32 states allow you to request them online, others by mail. If you have them, you should search for the letters IPV which stand for inactivated polio vaccine. If you're not sure you were fully vaccinated as a child and you can't find those records, then you should get a polio vaccine now. Even if you did get them as a child, getting another one now will be safe. It's very effective and it can protect you from polio. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now on set. So our friend there, Dr. John Torres, sort of opens the door to my next question. If you were vaccinated as a child, do you still need to get a booster or anything like that now as an adult? No, Tom. Polio boosters are not recommended. If you got the polio vaccine as a kid, doctors believe that 
the immunity lasts a lifetime. And right now, according to the CDC, about 93 percent of children under the age of two have already been vaccinated against polio. OK, good to know. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you for that. For more on the shakeup at the CDC and the multiple public health emergencies the agency is facing, including new headlines on monkeypox, I want to bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Azar, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. So first thing, I want to get your reaction to the news from the CDC. How do you explain that to our viewers? What, what exactly is going on there? So, you know, I think we've all had a similar reaction over the last couple of years. Uh, yeah, actually, a few years, sort of a whiplash, right, with the way the CDC has communicated public health guidance. Um, and I, I think what we're seeing is the, um, you know, admission on the part of, of Dr. Walensky that there were clearly some shortcomings um, in the way they handled the pandemic. There was recently two reviews that were done, one by HHS and the other one by CDC that essentially said that the way they are handling from science to communication is outdated. So for example, one of the things that they're hoping to do is to incentivize the people who are working at CDC, not just about publishing papers, but about really analyzing and communicating data much more quickly, much more effectively. What they're planning on doing, Tom, is actually leading an overhaul and having creating a new executive council to basically implement all of these changes that they would like to see happen. It really boils down to how, how are you transparent? How do you take complicated scientific information and translate that into um, easily digestible, you know, easily interpreted um, you know, public health guidance. I, I think on one hand, it's great. They want to make it more efficient. I think on the other hand, people are nervous because you have COVID, you have monkeypox. We're talking about polio now. Yeah. I do want to ask you about monkeypox. So, yeah. so it, it's a growing concern. 12,000 cases more than any other country in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. And you have what I'm reading here is eight children who have monkeypox. So we've had you on before. We understand how, how men are getting monkeypox. How are children getting monkeypox? Well, you know, I, I think now we've been burned a few times already when we, you know, talking about, um, always it's easy to draw analogies or make comparisons to other illnesses. You know, COVID, it, it wasn't airborne, then it was airborne. We actually learned quite a bit about monkeypox in that originally we thought that everyone would have very visible lesions and you would know to stay away from somebody who had an unusual rash. And then we slowly found out that these lesions were more hidden and that you needed more prolonged skin-to-skin -skin contact. But we also know that the virus can survive on surfaces. It's probably not the major mode of transmission, but never say never. And look at the numbers. I mean, it's eight children out of 12,000 cases. And those kids, we don't know a lot of detail about the way those cases were acquired. We, we don't know how, the, how is, we, they were transmitted? Okay. We don't. But I mean, you know, because of patient privacy, that's obviously a concern. But, you know, if you're a household contact with someone who might be infected and you're sharing linens or you're sharing bath towels, you're sh sharing common surfaces, it is absolutely feasible that you will you can get infected. We've seen pregnant women get infected. It shouldn't surprise anyone that a communicable disease will spill over um, from the group that it you know originally uh, affected. Think take HIV. We used to think it was only a disease of gay men. Well, that we right. couldn't have been more wrong about that. You know, I think I think the major concern here is that we're, school is starting. Kids are going back to school. And people are worried that this outbreak could could grow even bigger. I, I mean, we've been talking about this now, I think, for more than a month. Right. And it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Right. W what are you telling patients? What should our viewers know? You know, I think people need to keep it into perspective and understand that the vast majority of people who develop monkeypox are not. I mean, it, and this is taking nothing away from the patients who've suffered significantly from this. But that is not how all monkeypox presents. It can just be a very mild viral syndrome. What I will take the opportunity to say is that flu season is right around the corner. And the Southern Hemisphere has had a terrible flu season, which does portend a more difficult season here for us. So I think top of mind for parents should be really more COVID and flu than monkeypox. Yeah. Be aware. We're learning every day. As I said, we've been burned before. If things change and the transmission becomes, you know, uh, you know, different or a different avenue or pathway, or we are seeing more susceptibility in our children, um, it will certainly raise an alarm. And maybe there will be a cause for more widespread vaccination. But at the moment, I don't think parents need to worry unduly about right. monkeypox. I think it's the growing number of cases. And then some of those images you're seeing a lot in the media are, are, are pretty striking. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Azar, always great to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. When we come back, the party crackdown, the new technology Airbnb is rolling out that will track certain user data to prevent them from throwing parties at their rentals. Those details coming up.
All right, we are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we begin with a man facing a slew of charges for a hit and run in New York City. Surveillance video, you see it here, shows a driver barreling into three pedestrians, including a mother and a toddler who was in a stroller. All three victims, though, are expected to be okay. Police say the 28-year-old suspect was fleeing from a traffic stop in Brooklyn and was driving with a suspended license. He's now facing more than a dozen charges. Next to the dangerous and fiery rescue caught on camera in Texas. Body cam footage shows four officers racing towards a burning pickup truck in McKinney outside of Dallas. A bystander was trying to help, but the driver was unconscious and the doors were jammed. The officers eventually able to pull the man through a broken window just moments before the entire cab became engulfed in flames. That driver remains in the hospital tonight. And the investigation tonight after a massive fire destroyed a motorsports shop in New Jersey. Take a look at this aerial footage shows the roof of the building near Mount Holly collapsing after it was engulfed in flames. Crews removed as much equipment as they could out of the building before having to retreat. That fire also closing part of a highway. No injuries, though, reported and no word yet on what caused that. And Airbnb is rolling out new technology to crack down on parties. The technology looks at renters' history on the app, including how far they live from the rental property and whether they're renting on a weekend or a weekday. In test markets, it cut unauthorized gatherings by 35%. The company has tried to clamp down on parties since a deadly shooting at one of their properties back in 2019. Okay, now to a wrongful death lawsuit being filed by the family of a man who died in police custody. The family's attorney releasing disturbing body cam video showing the treatment of Jarvis Evans, who was suffering from a mental health episode. He later died in a cell. Maya Eaglin spoke to Evans' mother, who's calling for justice. We do want to warn you, the video you're about to see may be difficult to watch. Tonight, graphic video showing a man being detained by police before he was found unresponsive in his cell. Look, calm down. Okay. Released by his family's attorney, now filing a wrongful death lawsuit against the Lawrence County Sheriff in South Carolina. Never in my life would I have thought that this shame would come to Lawrence County through my house. If my son's death causes humanity to prevail and change to come to the law enforcement facilities in Lawrence County in the state of South Carolina, then his life will not be in vain. Jarvis Evans called 911 for himself during a mental health episode last July, according to the lawsuit. Audio of the call suggests that Evans felt threatened. Uh, I think somebody down here uh, stalking us and they're just uh, all over the place. And I just need the officer to come out here. I just feel like my life is in danger. The lawsuit says that Evans suffered from mental illness and that sheriff's deputies routinely helped transport Evans to a psychiatric facility. On the night of July 29th, according to the lawsuit, his mother told a deputy on scene that she believed Evans had, quote, taken some drugs laced with something and requested he be taken to the hospital. But the lawsuit says officials took Evans to the Johnson Detention Center instead, with plans to charge him with two misdemeanors, a breach of peace and resisting arrest. When they arrive, Evans is allegedly placed in a chokehold against a glass window. The department prohibits all forms of chokeholds, according to the lawsuit. No, you don't. Y'all hurt me. I didn't hurt no, you. y'all hurt me. Y'all killed me. Evans complains of being unable to breathe and begins screaming for his mother's help. Mom, got my ID. Deputies place leg restraints on Evans. Oh, man, calm the f- down. The deputies put a spit mask on Evans's head, then lift him off the ground and into an emergency restraint chair. Maybe if you didn't come in acting like a complete or we wouldn't have to do this to you. Deputies continue to secure him in the chair, then take out tasers. Move any leg, I will take you. Tried to kick us. But no, I didn't. I yeah, you did. To... Moments later, as Evans grows more agitated, a deputy allegedly tases him at least three times. Ah! Job does, he tased me. Evans is then brought to a cell which is when the released video ends. The lawsuit saying he, quote, continued to yell and thrash, was sweating profusely, and, quote, making statements that did not make sense. The suit also says he was not checked on. They have to be medically cleared every 15 minutes. There has to be some type of supervision to check the inmate to make sure they're still doing well. That never happened. 
A deputy walking by later noticed Evans was unresponsive, and deputies contacted medical staff for the first time, according to the lawsuit. Evans was then transported to a hospital and pronounced dead just before 3 a.m. on July 30th. NBC News requested public records surrounding the incident, but did not receive them from the county. The Lawrence County Sheriff confirmed his office was served with the lawsuit and provided NBC News with a statement saying he requested an internal affairs investigation into the matter and an investigation from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Vision, but would not comment further. Our NBC News law enforcement analysts weighing in. When I was an officer, I've had to deal with people in mental crisis uh, and, you know, they're unpredictable. And so you have to really um, modulate what you're doing uh, based on what you have before you. And it can become very, very risky. Um, but what you don't want is for people to d- use more force than what is required to take a person into custody. Now his mother hoping his story will bring justice. The world has to see how my tr- son was treated. The videos have has to be used to ensure that this kind of treatment does not happen to another mother's son or to another son's father. And- All right, Maya Eaglin joins us now live on set. So Maya, obviously a difficult story. You spoke to the mother there. What, what else did you want people to know? So there are two other things that really stood out from our conversation today. First, it's that even though that video is hard to watch, she wants people to understand the emotions they feel when watching it in hopes of it creating further systemic change. And the second was that Out of all of this that's been happening, the hardest part for her was being the minister at her son's funeral and watching her five grandchildren grieve their father. She's worried about how they're going to be supported and taken care of now. Okay, Maya Eaglin first. Maya, thank you for that. We turn now to Top Stories Global Watch and the stunning new video from inside the relentless firefight in eastern Spain. Firefighters in the Valencia region seen running from these intense flames as raging wildfires in the area burned tens of thousands of acres. Crews also scrambling to save massive mountainside homes. More than 2,000 residents forced to evacuate the area. At least two firefighters have been injured. So far, nearly 400 wildfires have burned across Spain this year. And the Pope getting a special surprise during his weekly address at the Vatican. New video shows a little boy running onto the altar and right up to the pontiff. The Pope welcoming the visitor with open arms, complimenting him on his courage and allowing him to stay at his side. The sweet moment came as the Pope was speaking about the crucial relationship between young people and the elderly. Okay, to the Americas now in a story we've been following for months in El Salvador. Mass arrests are continuing. The country's president says more than 50,000 people have been arrested in what he calls a war against gangs. You heard that right. 50,000 people. A mega prison is now under construction to house them, but human rights groups continue to sound the alarm. NBC's Cal Perry has more. Tonight, mass arrests in El Salvador continue. The country's president, Nayib Bukele, doubling down on what he has called a war on gangs. The government announcing that at least 50,000 people have been arrested since late March. Arrests that they have then touted across social media for months, using the hashtag war against gangs. And taking to Twitter yet again, this time to say the exception has made it possible to intensify the war against gangs and get thousands of terrorists off the streets. Over 1% of the Salvadoran population has been detained under the state of emergency and is being held without basic rights to defense. This week, Congress extending a state of emergency that was put into place back in March. The decision following a bloody weekend where more than 80 people were killed. It allows the government to arrest anyone they suspect is involved with a gang and suspends their constitutional rights, including the right to an attorney. There's also uh, a demonstrated pattern um, of torture, uh, inhumane treatment uh, and physical abuse in the prisons. Uh, and as of this moment, Crystal Sala, our organization, has been able to verify 67 deaths of prisoners in custody of the state. Some of those appear to have been uh, who have have appeared to have died as a result of uh, severe physical abuse. And now the president sharing video of a new mega prison being constructed in a rural town. The government says it's a, quote, terrorism confinement center that will, quote, have room for 40,000 terrorists who will be cut off, they say, from the outside world. In a recent poll by CID Gallup, Bukele's approval rating is at 86 percent, with many Salvadorians in strong support of his drastic measures. 
en realidad nos hiciera sentir que este país es nuestro. But some worry human rights are being violated and that innocent people are getting caught up in the large-scale raids. Por cuando uno sabe que su familia no tiene nada que ver con pandillas, si vivimos en esas comunidades es porque uh, no tenemos para otro lugar a donde irnos. A country caught between gang violence and personal freedoms. Cal Perry, NBC News. All right, we are back now with Money Talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. New data showing U.S. retail sales remain flat in July as falling gas prices led consumers to spend more money online. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Illinois. So, Maggie, I know you've been tracking this for us tonight. What do economists make of today's numbers? Did consumers just shift the money they've been spending on gas to other retail items? Essentially, yeah, but they're really only shifting that money to spending it on staples like food. And you mentioned online uh, sales are up. But when you combine that with in-person, things that you want but don't need, like clothing, those are largely going down. And one more category that also saw a hit month to month is car sales. And in short, basically, we went to an auto dealer here uh, in the Chicago suburbs, and they tell us sales are down not because demand is down, but they say basically they don't have the inventory. They don't have the cars to sell. And they blame that largely on supply chain issues, and in particular, the chip shortage. But this, just to kind of put it in perspective, was a huge suburban Toyota dealership. Almost half of their massive parking lot was completely empty. Yeah, and and that's even with a lot of sticker shock that shoppers had for cars because prices were so sky high. I do want to ask you, because there's been so many sort of strange things happening with this economy. Retailers are struggling, some of them, including Target, now saying its earnings fell 90 percent from a year ago. That was a huge headline from Target today. Yeah, they took a massive hit. Executives say they did kind of see it coming because they said basically during the peak of the supply chain issues in the pandemic, they ordered a ton of inventory. Well, now it's all in and they have excess. So they basically marked a lot of it down and they say that hurt their bottom line. So we'll see how that plays out in the future. At the same time, Walmart reporting a strong month to month, saying they're seeing a lot of higher income families come through their doors looking for lower prices and generic brands, basically everybody doing everything they can to save amid these soaring inflation rates. Yeah, and all of this and not a great day on Wall Street on top of all that. Okay, Maggie Vespa first. Maggie, we appreciate that. Finally tonight, a monkey mystery. It all started with a 911 call that got disconnected. Dispatchers in Central California tried to call and text the number back. No response. The address associated with the phone led sheriff deputies right to Zoo to You. That's where the mystery deepens. And nobody could figure out, no, it wasn't us. We didn't call. And then at the same time, they all said, it must have been Root. Root? So who is Root? Or what is Root? Maybe the better question. With more on this prime, or I guess I should say primate suspect, I want to bring in Zoo to You directors David and Lisa Jackson. So David, first to you, uh, I think we're meeting Root right there. That's it. That's her, yeah. And so what, what, do you, what is your theory? You, you think Root got the telephone and somehow called 911? That's exactly what happened. So these, these types of monkeys are extremely intelligent, Fujin monkeys from Central and South America. They're like ape smart. And uh, she likes to manipulate things. In the wild, they have to break into some seriously difficult fruit and um, nuts and things, and they use tools. And um, you can see she's uh, very much into discovery. So... Uh, she was riding back with Lisa on the uh, golf cart, the zoo cart that we have here. And the zoo phone was just sitting in a holder and she got a hold of it and we didn't know it. And she just started pressing buttons and ended up with the right combination. And we had no idea until literally an hour later, we were sitting in front of our shop working and uh, the sheriff's drove up. And, and does, does Root have a history? And like, call 911, everything's fine. And, yeah. and uh, what's the number they called? And they told us the number, and we figured out that was the soup phone, and then we put two and two together, and here's the culprit. Does, does Root have a history of, of playing with phones or getting into trouble? Uh, getting into trouble, yes. Um, <laughs> playing with phones, not so much. I mean, it's happened before. Um, she has... Uh, Ended up texting people a bunch of gibberish on accident when uh, the phone was left on, but uh, uh, never something like this. No, we there was a complete surprise, and we were very embarrassed and <laughs> very sorry uh, to the sheriffs. The sheriffs were great, though. They, it was I was surprised that I was actually very impressed. They came out and checked on us. 
Lisa, David's doing all the talking here, but you, you seem to be handling Root there. What, what can you tell yeah, us about, about the monkey? So, yeah, infection <laughs> monkeys are like chimpanzee smart. So it's just in their nature. It's, it's a survival for them to manipulate things. That's how they get into that really hard fruit where they live in South America. Um, so it's just natural for her to just monkey business, you know, just to get into stuff and investigate. Oh, and they learn from things. So Root learns that if she ever gets a hold of a phone, she's really good at swiping. And she knows that when she swipes with her really cool little hand with thumbs, that she gets the images on the phone to change. And she learns, she learned that. So who knows what she did with the phone? Uh, honestly, I just turned my head for a split second, saw she had the phone, took it from her and uh, didn't check it again. I, I walked away from the golf cart and from the zoo phone. Um, so I had no idea what had happened. But as soon as they explained it to me, I was like, uh oh, we're in trouble. The monkey did it. Wait, so, so I said, guys, really, let me show you the monkey. And then they, they started laughing, the officers. Um, it, I think they got a kick out of it. Um, they, it, you know, they were like, oh, that was made for a fun, uh, fun day. We got to meet a monkey. Oops. And so, so, and so Root was able to use an operate an iPhone. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. iPhone. Yeah, iPhone. Yep. Oh, that's that's incredible. How long did it take the, the, the officers or was there no real detective work to figure out a monkey was behind all of this? Yeah, not a real. It took a few minutes. <laughs> it took a few minutes for us to for them to tell us. You know, there was a nine one one call from this address, and uh, and then that baffled us. And we said, you know, gosh, I hope everybody's still okay. And we started thinking, and then we asked, what was the number that called? And when they told us, it was the O six O four number. And we said, oh my gosh, that's the zoo phone. And then that's when we put two and two together and yeah. went, oh my god, the monkey called nine one one. Oh, well, yeah. I'm glad it was nothing serious. David and Lisa Jackson from Zoo to You, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. Do me a favor. Don't give Root our telephone number. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate that she joined the show as well. Thanks so much, guys. We're just happy we could contribute to the nation's uh, fun stories. Yeah, we do, too. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. All right, we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way.